Well, good morning. We're so happy to have you here with us again for another Youth Alive Sunday service. Uh, hope you guys are doing well, staying nice and snug and warm, wrapped up with your blankets. Uh, when we're recording this, I hear the cars driving by, just all the water in the streets just spraying. So I know that when we finish and go outside, we're just going to get pelted with water. But believe it or not, this is my favorite weather because this is sweater weather. This is blanket weather. And I love, this is another thing that people don't know about me. I love winter because the fashion, oh man, winter fashion is so fun. You, you can't dress up in the summer because, you know, if you do that, you get too hot and you'd sweat and look gross. But in the winter, you can wear all the accessories and all the clothes you want. And, oh, man, don't get me started. I love it. <laughs> so, anyway, that's neither here nor there. Let's go ahead with our worship this morning. And today's worship, we're going to be starting with our call to worship. Our call to worship this morning is out of Psalm 19. We're going to spend a lot of time in Psalm 19 today. But our call to worship starting this morning, starting in verse 1, it says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. And them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs its course with joy." It's rising, sorry about that. It's rising is from the end of the heavens and its circuit to the end of them. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. Let's pray. Dear Father, thank you that your word tells us that you are obvious, that you are not hidden, but that you can be found. So much so can you be found that the whole creation cries out testimony to you. And there's not a single word in all of creation, whose testimony man cannot hear. That's going to be a theme today that we're going to be talking about, Father. And I just pray that you can prepare our hearts to recognize creation testifies to you. Jesus says that if man will not praise you, the very rocks will cry out in praise. So, Father, help us to understand the need that we have for you and the reasonableness it is for us to believe in you. Father, help us to to dedicate our life to you in a way that is worthy of our call. And Father, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's go ahead and worship in praise together. What gift of grace is Jesus my redeemer There is no
Well, welcome back. Um, let's go ahead and open our service with one more prayer. Dear Father, help us to offer praise to you. Help it to be a, a praise that comes from our heart and is genuine. And Father, we pray that we would see you with a sense of reasonableness. We are reasonable to believe. We are sensible to hold your scripture to be good. And Father, therefore, we are not wrong to worship. Help us understand that, because that, that's one of the themes for today's text. Father, help us with this. Help our worship to be acceptable to you. And Father, we pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, as we um, continue with our series through the book of Romans, uh, if you remember, we're in the uh, book of Romans uh, chapter 1. And normally I have a big introduction, but we're just going to jump right into the text. And so let's go ahead with our service today. Our sermon title is Avoid Making Yourself an Enemy to God. Avoid Making Yourself an Enemy to God. Now that, that's, a, that's a big title. Um, so let's see what Scripture has to say about that. Let's go ahead and read starting in verse 18. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world, in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking, and foolish hearts were, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. So when we read this text today, um, I want to prep our uh, understanding of it by asking you if you've ever been in a situation to where you saw justice happen, right? Uh, maybe, uh, maybe a top football player of the rival team got kicked out of the game, right? <laughs> or maybe a bully at school finally got nailed by the principal, Maybe a, a, a criminal that's just been ravaging the city is finally caught by the, the police, right? And how does it feel when you hear about this kind of justice happening? It's a pretty good feeling, isn't it? Uh, I'm actually watching a, a TV show on Hulu these days, and it's a, it's a murder mystery TV series where they just kind of show how all these murderers, um, kind of sad, <laughs> how these murderers, they get caught. And what happens is, is it shows the court drama of what's happening. And at the end of the, the day, invariably, the, the judge slams his gavel and says, guilty. And it's funny because then they show all the people outside of the courthouse waiting in the street, waiting to hear the news of what happens. And once they say guilty, they all start dancing in the streets, right? Like the people outside the, cor the courtyard, they feel just such great joy at what had happened. But if I were to tell you that God, in his ultimate power, has decided that he is to sentence people to an eternity in hell for their unrighteousness, how would you feel about that? It's a noticeably different feeling, isn't it? <laughs> like we can look at the situation where the judge punishes, right? Where a judge condemns a criminal. We feel rejoicing. We feel justice. We sing the praises of the judge as, as if they're like a, a, a local hero, but when we hear that God has the same responsibilities to judge wickedness, the dancing stops, the joyfulness is no more. And instead of welcoming God as a hero, we recoil back in anger and disgust, don't we? And the reason for that is because even though we want ju to see that justice is brought against wickedness, the very idea that God delivers wicked or that God delivers judgment against wicked people challenges our perception of what we want God to be in our lives, right? You see, for some reason, our minds reason that if God is capable of judgment, then it really brings in a question of whether or not God is good. If God can judge, 
can he then have goodness to him, right? It really causes us to question that. And the reality is that most people, when they, when they hear about God's judgment, it's not that they struggle with the fact that God can just condemn anybody, but rather the very thing that they struggle with when God says he condemns wickedness is that people look at that and they know that when God says he will condemn, invariably they know that he intends to condemn people that we think are good. That's the whole problem that we have when we hear that God condemns wickedness. And therefore, when God says that he will judge the world, it fills us not only with a sort of confusion, like why? But for many of us, it fills us with anger and even hatred towards God. He's wrong. He's evil. He's unrighteous. But you see, in writing this section that we are going through in Romans today, the thing that Paul really wants to point out here is that just because you don't like the fact that God will judge, it can't keep it from happening. It's, it's kind of, this is a crude example, but just because you want something to happen doesn't make it so, right? Like, so for example, if a guy were to sit down in the middle of the street here on, uh, on Duarte, just right in the middle of the street in rush hour, and he would sit there saying, I don't think that this is dangerous because I don't want it to be dangerous, <laughs> that doesn't mean that he's going to be okay, right? Like, regardless of what he thinks, he's going to get flattened. That's just the reality of the story. Good luck. <laughs> you can do it, but it's not going to work out well. That's the message that Paul is trying to communicate. But more importantly that, than that, the nuance of what Paul is showing here is that when God judges, he judges rightly. I'm going to say that again. The nuance of what Paul is showing here is not merely to say that God is going to judge and there's nothing you can do about it, but rather the language that Paul is using here is that when God judges, he does so rightly. In fact, we see in verse 18 of our reading, it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness do what? They suppress the truth. Now that word wrath that we see there, it's a pretty strong word. In fact, I think it's right here that most people, when they hear this passage, it's probably safe to say that right here is where they start to get turned off. Right? Like They hear the wrath is coming, like, okay, that's enough. And the reason for that is because wrath, when we look at this, it's not like God's just saying, okay, I'm going to give you wrath, and that means that for a little while you're going to have to go to your room and do a timeout. It's not like he's saying, okay, sit down and think about what you've done and then come back and talk to me and, and we'll talk about it. But rather, when God delivers wrath, we know that he intends to bring destruction retribution, and he intends to do so because he has anger. He's angry that he's been violated in some way. And as people, we have a really hard time with that. In fact, we just don't like having an angry God. <laughs> we want to have a God that likes us. We want to have a God that's our friend, right? We don't want a God that has, you know, that's harboring negative feelings towards us. That feels like, you know, toxic, <laughs> you know, like toxic masculinity, but against God, it feels like. But setting aside your knee-jerk reaction uh, for a moment, I really want you to take a look at what it says specifically um, here in verse 18. It says, when the wrath of God comes, where does it come from? It says, the wrath of God is revealed from where? From heaven. See, Paul is saying something very specific when he says that the wrath of God comes from heaven. You see, when he says that wrath comes from heaven, what he is saying is that when wrath comes, it comes from the realm of the perfect holiness, from perfect righteousness. It comes from the place of perfect purity. Simply put, that because God's wrath comes from heaven, regardless of how you feel about it, it cannot be wrong. And the conclusion here then is that when someone reveals the wrath of uh, receives the wrath of God, they receive it justly. And then when God gives it, he gives it as a perfect God who is not at fault for giving that judgment. That is a packed section. But that's what that is saying when Paul says the wrath comes from heaven. He doesn't say the wrath comes from hell. The wrath of God comes from heaven. And now here's where we freak out, because when we hear this, uh, we, we you know, run up and we say, well, you're telling me that mankind therefore deserves to be judged by God? 
Well, it seems to be that that's what it's saying, right? That God is revealing his anger, his wrath against all unrighteousness of men. That's what he, it seems to be saying here. But Paul, Paul's purpose of putting that here isn't to really offend you, but rather his purpose here is to inform you. You see that when God is, uh, when we feel that God is wrong to judge, we do so because we assume that it means that, well, but we're basically good, right? God can't judge me. I'm basically good. But Paul's eye-opening revelation here is that, sorry, but you're not. You, human, are not righteous. In fact, righteousness and unrighteousness are not at all what you think them to be. Instead, in verse 18, it shows us that apparently unrighteousness is not stuff that we don't like. It's not unrighteous just because I don't like it, but rather what is unrighteous is the thing, oh, I don't have it up there, we'll get there in a second, is the thing that goes against the character of God. Here, let's go to the slide now. It shows when God really, uh, reveals wrath from heaven against the unrighteousness of men, unrighteousness, according to God, is characterized as what? It's characterized as what is ungodly. That unrighteousness, as defined by Scripture, is what is is ungodly and goes against the character of God. Listen, we may live in a world where it's wrong to criticize people for the lifestyles that they live because, right, we look at it and we say, well, I don't have any right to tell them how to live. Who am I to say how somebody can be and can't be? Who am I to, to define what's right and wrong, right? That's how, you know, oftentimes it feels like in this culture. But what Paul is trying to let us know here by reading this section is that however we feel, it's just simply not the case. There is an objective reality. There is an objective morality. There is an objective definition of goodness. And there is a standard by which we can know whether or not something is good and righteous. And that standard by which we can look at something and say this is good or not is by comparing it against the very character of God. We know if something is righteous or not, whether or not it aligns with the character of God. You see, this is a big thing that Paul wants us to know here when we read this section. When he says that God will judge, we assume that he does it out of a place of dominance and power, right? He's wrong. He just does it because he can, right? Kind of like a dictator, right? Where someone says, uh, you know, the, the, the one who has the power makes the rules. Actually, I have, a, um, if you see on the screen here, those of you who, who saw Aladdin, <laughs> you remember Jafar in the scene uh, where he tries to dupe Aladdin into going and getting the lamp from the Cave of Wonders. You remember what he says here? He says, you know the golden rule, don't you? Whoever has the gold makes the rules, <laughs> right? That's how we feel about God when he says that he judges. We look at him and say, well, he's just doing it because he can. If he didn't have power, I wouldn't be wrong. But just, just because he has power, that, mean, that means that he, I'm wrong because he says I'm wrong, but really he's just a jerk. That's what it feels like. But Paul says that this is not how God operates. Rather, he tells us that God is defined to his very being by goodness so much that goodness itself is determined by whether or not God approves of it. That's how good God's character is. No, it's not God who is unrighteous, but rather it's man who is unrighteous simply because humankind has a heart within him that does not want to go with the things of God. Humankind desires the things against God, and therefore they make themselves an enemy to him in their heart. And by that unrighteousness that they earn by making themselves enemies, they choose, Scripture says, to suppress the truths about God. That's why God says he will come and bring judgment. Not because of the golden rule, whoever has the gold makes the rules. Not whoever has power gets to do what he wants. But because God is defined by goodness and we are not. And we have used that unrighteousness to malign the, the name of God. Okay? Fact is that God says that he will come back and judge. And he also says that there are apparently people who are an enemy to him who will be on the receiving end of that judgment. 
So then it becomes a really important question for us. Well, what's the question, right? <laughs> well, how do I avoid that judgment? How do I not be an enemy to God? Well, the truth is that Scripture actually tells us right here in this section. This isn't uh, um, necessarily like a, a judgment oracle. That's not what this is. This is an informative section, right? This isn't written here just to say, like, watch out, God's going to snuff you. But rather, Paul is writing this as the beginning of the gospel. He's explaining the gospel through Romans, and here he says, you have a problem, it is sin, but don't worry, you can make yourselves not an enemy to God. And so let's take a look at what it is Paul says that we need to do to make ourselves not an enemy to God. And the first thing that Paul says that we need to do if we do not want to become an enemy to God, is we need to make sure that we do not say, well, I just cannot know God, right? The first thing that it says here is we cannot question whether or not we can know if God exists, right? Don't sit there and say, well, I, don't, I just can't know him. I don't know if he's there. I just can't know. We see it here in this section right after um, verse 18. Verse 19 through 20 says this, for what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So therefore what? This is huge. Therefore, they are without excuse. In fact, Pastor Eric's sermon this morning, um, that was the whole focus of it, is like, no excuses. <laughs> you have no excuses for denying the existence of God. And, that, and that's really important for us to understand. You see, it's really common in today's culture to really seek a lifestyle, not that fits according to what, you know, is traditionally normal. Our, our culture is like, okay, we're done with normal and tradition. Instead, what do we do? We try to live life according to what seems most pleasurable to us most safe to us, most fulfilling and, and affirming to us. Whatever makes me feel good about myself, that's the way that I need to live. In fact, it seems that the slogan of this generation, it seems to be that this generation's slogan is, hey, that's, not, like, that's totally not my thing, but I'm glad it works for you. Right? We could probably put that <laughs> on the dollar bills as, the slogan that defines this generation. Not my thing, but glad it works for you. In fact, so great is our desire to live the way that we want that it seems to be like the greatest crime of all time to tell a person that their lifestyle is sinful, right? You can't do that. They have a right to live life they want to live. And you are wrong to tell them that what they're doing is wrong. That's the level uh, by which we have decided to live our lives here in today's culture. And to understand the reason of why it is like this, right? This isn't normal in history. People don't usually live this way. Usually they have traditions and they want to live strictly according to them. But the fact that we don't is really interesting. And, and the, in order to understand why we live like that, where we just say, hey, I live any way I want to, it takes a little bit of a history lesson, okay? This isn't all history, so <laughs> don't tune out. But it's kind of interesting. Now, we all remember from school that back in 1776, the uh, United States led a revolution against England and earned its independence, right? Right. I, 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 I hope we're not <laughs> losing anybody yet, right? You, you guys know that, right? In 1776, the United States led a revolution against England and earned its independence. But you see, little known is that on the other side of the world, around that exact time, another revolution was being fought, but it wasn't a, a revolution of, um, of politics, right? It wasn't a revolution of kingdoms, but rather it was a revolution of the way of thinking. It was a revolution of philosophy. You see, at that time, not everyone believed in God in the 18th century. There were, there were atheists out there or agnostics, okay? Not everyone believed. But no one could, in their right mind, deny through argument that God existed. It's, it's just that the, the arguments uh, that for the existence of God were just too good. People can choose privately that I won't believe in him, but they couldn't go up and argue, hey, God doesn't exist, because the arguments that they could come up with against God were just so bad. The arguments for God were just too good, right? The world is too perfectly made. 
the, our conscience is too strong. Life is too complex for any sane person to try to argue that God's just not there, right? And so it was for thousands of years, or 1,700 years, I guess I should say. But you see, in 1781, that all changed because a German man named Immanuel Kant, he decided that even though the world is complex, that alone cannot be proof of God. And he decided that knowledge of God cannot be had simply by reason and observation of the world alone. He determined that God had left his signature nowhere in creation, and therefore it was impossible to argue that God exists simply by saying, well, look at creation. He must exist, because look at creation. Immanuel Kant said that that is not a good enough argument. And let me tell you, that was a bombshell in the scientific community of the day. Because people now looked at creation and said, his handiwork is not enough for me to reason that he is there. And then over the next 200 years, society quickly moved forward with this idea of relativism. That, you know what, if God's not there, then who can tell me what to do? And over the next 200 years, people just started to choose to live the life that said, you know what, since I can't know God exists, I can't know his will, therefore nothing is wrong for me to do. I can do anything. Dostoevsky, he, he said that if God doesn't exist, then all things are permissible. And that's the world that we live in today. That's, we are the inheritors of that mindset, of that philosophy. But let me tell you, that people who advocate the, that way of thinking where they say, you know, I just can't know if God exists, right? Or they say, who am I to say what's right or wrong? I can't know. I can't know that God's there to say what's right or wrong. People who do that, they might do that in an effort to sound wise, to sound smart, or to make themselves feel like they're enlightened and educated. But the reality is, that scripture says that people who do this do so because they have an absolute height of human unrighteousness within them. That's what this scripture is saying. Why? Because at the very core of someone who says, I cannot know if God exists, is the attempt to suppress knowledge of God and to suppress his worthiness of devotion. That's where that comes from. That's what heart that comes from, Scripture says. And therefore, God says that the quickest way for us to make ourselves an enemy to him is to simply just say, it's not apparent that God is anywhere. I just simply can't know if he exists. In fact, let's put it this way. When you say, I cannot know God, think about what Jesus says to his enemies in, uh, whereas in Matthew chapter 7, when he looks to those who he casts into hell, what does he say? He says, well, then I don't know you, right? Away from me, I never knew you. For us to say that we do not know God is huge when it, uh, it comes to how God interprets our feelings about him. The plain truth of the matter is that regardless of what Immanuel Kant wants you to think, what people in society want you to think. The reality is that saying, I cannot know if God exists, is a wrong way of thinking. God can be known. In fact, not only can God be known, but Scripture says that he is known, that his existence is known. And so obvious and understandable is the knowledge of God that he's as understandable and as plain to see as the concept of gravity or even the, the concepts of hot and cold. That's what this scripture is saying, and it's huge. Let's take a look at it again. It says in verse 19, For what can be known about God is what? Is plain to them. Why? Because God shoved it in their face. <laughs> because God showed it to them. They cannot say, I do not know, because God showed it to them. It is as obvious as gravity or hot and cold. Now, you might be sitting there thinking, well, what do you mean God is as obvious as gravity? Like, I throw a ball up in the air, and God doesn't catch it, right? It falls down. <laughs> Gravity's there. I can't make a conclusion that God's there by throwing a ball. Your argument's wrong, Jeff. And actually, I have a funny, uh, a funny um, 
uh, happening that happened with our family this week. My my son, well, he's learning that God can do anything. He's learning that God is powerful. And uh, one day, my, this week, my wife was cooking, and she was cooking dinner. And my son, Tristan, he said, uh, Mom, I want you to come play with me. And Mom was busy cooking dinner. So she said, No, Tristan, I, c- I can't come play with you. I'm cooking dinner. And he said, But I want you to play. And so he said, or, So she said, Well, who will cook dinner then if I don't cook dinner for you? Like, if I come to play with you, who will cook dinner? And Tristan, without missing a beat, he goes, well, God can do that. He can do anything. <laughs> it's, it's a true story. <laughs> Sometimes I think that my son is, is too smart for his own good. <laughs> but that, anyway, that, that, that's not, neither here nor there. The point of it is this, is that just by observing the world with our, our physical senses, we can come to the conclusion that God is just hard to see, right? We, we can't interact with him uh, in a very similar way that we can interact with the rest of creation. And so, therefore, we might be tempted to think that God is just hard to interpret, hard to see. In fact, Scripture even confirms this in a lot of ways. Um, scripture says that there are many things that we can't know about God. In fact, later in this book, towards the end, in Romans chapter 11, it says this. It says, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. Oh, how deep it is. How unsearchable are his judgments, and how inscrutable are his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor, or who has given a gift to him that he he might need to be repaid? The fact is that God, in many ways, cannot be understood, ever. God is huge. I think even in heaven, there will be a lot of things that we just won't know about God because we're just so small, and God is infinite. He's just so unknowable in so many ways. But the remarkable thing about this passage is that Paul says that even though he is unsearchable, he can be known. And even though he is invisible, he can be seen. The invisible is seeable. And the unsearchable is findable, is what he's saying here. And think about the impact of that statement. God may be obscured from us, but he's not hidden. That's what Paul is saying. And and the reason that we can know God is there is because Paul says that he has these things that are called invisible attributes that are plain for us to see. These invisible attributes that he shows us about him so that even though we can't see him, we can interpret that he is there. Specifically, he says that in creation, we can observe that something with immense power must have created all of this. We can interpret his eternal power. And secondly, he, just, he said that by looking at creation, we can understand that God has a divine nature, that he's omnipotent, that he knows everything, that he can see into future, that he created with personal intention right? And that he exists beyond space and time. We can tell that by just looking at creation. We can know. Therefore, based on what Paul says, is that because we can know those things, man can conclude that we owe God our eternal worship and obedience. That is what Paul says. Because we can see that God exists, that he must have power, that he has a divine character. That means that we as humans, therefore, owe him our personal devotion. That's the reasoning that Paul says here. Now, notice really quick at what I'm not saying Paul says, okay? Notice really quick at what Paul is not saying. It says here in this section that God's existence is plainly obvious. But what it's not saying is that the gospel is plainly obvious, right? We can't look at creation and say, whoa, what a beautiful mountain. That must mean that I'm a sinner and that 2,000 years ago, God sent his only son, Jesus, to be incarnated in flesh, to die on the cross for my sins, and that if I just believe in him, then I can go to heaven and have eternal life. Thank you, mountain, for showing me that. <laughs> That's not how that works. We, we can't look at creation and come to the conclusion of specific things about God, right? That's what we call special revelation, and special revelation can't be known unless God verbally tells us through the form of prophecy, right? That's how that comes out. Rather, what Paul is saying here is that God's existence is known through what we call a general revelation or a revelation that gives us the simple knowledge of God, right? 
we can, by observing existence, come to the conclusion that God exists. And what's more is that verse 20 says that he gives that knowledge to everyone. How? Because let's go back to the screen. It says this, because he showed it. Not by accident did he leave his signature here. He shows us with the beauty of creation, with the complexity of creation, with the, uh, with the, the, the beauty of our mind and our conscience, that we know God exists. We see in Psalm 19 this very thing. It says, the, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the skies above proclaim his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech about God, and night to night reveals knowledge of him. And there is no speech, there are no words that creation testifies whose words are not heard by man. That is huge. Simply put, everything screams God's glory, and there is no testimony of all creation that man does not hear. Look, I know what Immanuel Kant said. I know what he said. And I know that he said that we cannot know God and that it seems like that's what smart people say, okay? But Scripture says that he is absolutely wrong. Absolutely wrong. There, the world is too beautiful, too perfect. Life is too complex, too impossible to happen by chance. Absolute, scientifically, absolutely impossible to happen by chance. The numbers don't add up. And our conscience is too uniformly consistent. We know that things are wrong consistently across the board. This is too much to prove that God exists. And therefore, if we do not worship God, Jesus even said that the rocks will cry out, right? <laughs> even if we don't worship, the rocks will proclaim His glory. We need to not say that we cannot know if God exists or not. Because that makes us an enemy to him. Because that's what he says to people when he casts them into judgment. I never knew you. Instead, when we look at creation, if we want to make sure that we are not making ourselves an enemy to God, we need to see his fingerprints on everything that he made. And we need to be able to say, this exists because God made it. That's what he says. How do we make sure that we do not become an enemy of God? Simple. Refuse to say, I cannot know God. You can Second thing that we need to do. So the first thing is, do not say, I cannot know God. The second thing is actually kind of the next step, is that those who do the first thing then commit the second thing. So don't commit the, the crime, right, of saying, I cannot know if God exists or not. But the second thing that we need to avoid is this. Well, for those who deny God's existence, we'll naturally feel temptation to do this. But we must not say that I am worthy of defining what's right or wrong. We must avoid making ourselves an enemy of God by refusing to say, I am worthy of defining what's right and wrong. We see that in Romans chapter 1, verse 21 through 23. It says, For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him. But instead they became futile in their thinking, and their, fuel, their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, and they exchanged the glory of immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. You see, something interesting happens when mankind denies God and denies that they can have knowledge of him. Uh, they're left in a predicament. <laughs> the predicament is simply this. They're, they have nothing left to worship. They, they've cast it out. and like, well, now what do we worship, right? And for mankind, that's actually a bad thing. Why? Well, actually, it's actually kind of ironic, the, the re, uh, reason behind that. You see, mankind has such great desire to deny God's existence, but yet at the very core of their being, they actually need to worship something. It's actually just the way that God created us, right? We have to worship something. We were created to worship something. And if I don't have something to worship, then I'll make it up. 
In fact, I'm kind of reminded of, of this phenomenon happening. Um, I don't know if you guys know who Ronald Reagan is. He, he was uh, president of the United States. Um, but he actually had a son, Ron Reagan. Ronald Reagan, as far as I know, uh, was a very devoted uh, believer. But Ron Reagan, not. <laughs> His son, not. Ron Reagan is actually an atheist, and he, he's part of this group called the Freedom of Religion Foundation. And this organization is dedicated to stopping the spread of religion in the United States. And specifically, they do not want people who have faith to come into politics, right? They want atheists to stay in politics. They don't want religious people in politics. And he, he's so smug. What he does is he goes on TV and he looks people in the face and he goes, Hi, I'm Ron Reagan, lifelong atheist and not afraid of burning in hell. <laughs> and I look at that and I think, this is funny. Because this guy embodies what it's like to um, pursue a world without God with passion. And yet we look at, in all of the, the discoveries of man, and in all of the discoveries of historians, and all the discoveries of philosophers and explorers, consistently, again, guys like Kierkegaard, a, f a, f a famous philosopher, they come to the conclusion that even though man wishes that he could be freed from God, at the same time, they find that man is what they call homo religiosus, right? Or inherently religious. Mankind is inherently and incurably religious. Even to the, the most hidden uh, tribes in the jungles, they'll whack their way through the, the weeds and they get there and they find the, 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 the tribe and they talk to them and they find out even here <laughs> they have found religion of some kind. Mankind is just incurably religious. And some would say, well, that's because man is just afraid of death. They invent religion because they're afraid of dying. Uh, but that, that's not what scripture says. In fact, Scripture says something completely different. Instead, Scripture says that the reason that man is so religious is because when God made man, he created man in his own image. And then when he did so, he did as Ecclesiastes 3.11 says, he put eternity into man's heart, and yet so that he cannot find out what, has, what God has done from beginning to end. When God created man, he didn't put the knowledge of what God did or who he is. He only put the burning knowledge that God exists. And we see that. Even in the littlest of babies, they understand that things just don't appear out of nowhere. You ask them, how did, how did the stars get there? And they say, because mommy put them there. <laughs> Even they know something can't come from nothing. Even they know God exists somewhere because God planted that knowledge in our hearts. And so strong is our desire to worship that when we don't have God to worship, we just make stuff up. <laughs> well, I don't have God, so I'll just worship that. <laughs> and that's what they do. In fact, um, we see in verse 23 of our reading, that's exactly what happens. Is that when man ignores God, right? They have nothing left. What do they do? Well, then they just turn to images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things, right? That's what it says. Isaiah chapter 44 has a, a, an illustration of what this looks like. Isaiah 44 kind of paints a picture. This is a, par a paraphrase, but it says, a man plants a cedar in the tree and then he harvests it and it becomes fuel for his fire. Half of it he uses to roast his meat and says, oh, I'm warm and satisfied. And then the rest of it he carves into a god, his idol, and then he says, deliver me, for you are my God. Absolute foolishness, right? But that's the point that Paul's trying to make here. The product of people denying God is that they claim to be wise, but instead they make themselves fools, and their hearts are darkened, and they do foolish and dark things. And at the very height of that foolishness, what do they do? Man doesn't just stop to worship trees or animals, but what does it say here? It's, oh, uh, let's go back here. What does it say? It says that at the height of foolishness of man, man it rejects God, who he knows to be perfect and immortal, and then turns his worship to what? Images resembling himself. At the height of foolishness, man worships himself. Now, Paul's point here is to show the progression of what foolishness of mankind looks like. That's true, right? 
God shows the progression of foolishness, man, then animals, then birds, then creeping things, right? We see that. But his main point here isn't just to show that man will de- degenerate into worshiping the stupidest things, but rather is to show this, that when man no longer gives honor or thanks to God, he turns that honor and thanks to himself. He honors himself as the height of creation, and he gives thanks to himself for making this world so good. That's what the scripture says. And therefore, when they do that, they set themselves up as their own God of their own lives, ready to define the very definition of what's right and wrong. I am God of this creation. I am the height of all that exists. And therefore, I and I alone am worthy to decide what is right and wrong. In fact, we see this working out just a couple verses later in, in, uh, in Romans chapter 1. Uh, this is another paraphrase. But it says that mankind, they're filled with all manner of unrighteousness and evil. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness, and sexual depravity. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, prideful, Uh, inventors of evil, and then then the list goes on. And then it says this. This is what mankind does when he thinks that he's worthy of of choosing right and wrong. And then it says this. And though they they know God's righteous decrees and that those who do such things deserve to die, they not only do them anyway, but they approve others who do those things as well. That's what man does at the height of his foolishness. He worships himself and makes the conclusion, I know this is what God said, but I am right to choose good and bad. I am capable of doing that. That's the height of the foolishness of man. And what this shows us is that even though um, man desires to decide the definition between, between right and wrong, even if he had the opportunity to define what's right and wrong, Scripture makes it very clear that mankind simply is just not capable of doing it. We just can't. It's just not within our ability. The truth is that man is lost in sin and totally corrupted in our conscience and in our hearts to the very core. In fact, Scripture says this in uh, Jeremiah 17, 9. It says that the heart is desperately, is above all things, desperately uh, wicked and deceitful. Right? The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Some versions say, and desperately wicked. And what Jeremiah is saying here is that if there was one thing that can define the human heart, it wouldn't be that man's heart is good or joyful or compassionate or reasonable or you know, smart or anything like that. But rather, what this is showing is that if one thing could define the heart of man, it is this. His heart is deceitful and loves sin. That's the one thing that we can know about the heart of man. It's deceitful, it lies, and it loves enjoying sin. And the implication of this is huge for you guys. It's huge. Because that what that means is that though something might seem right to you, though it might seem right for you to follow the leadings of your heart, because how can my heart be wrong? In my heart I know what is right and what is wrong. Even though it's very tempting to feel that way, Scripture tells us that those who choose to listen to their hearts for right and wrong will always be deceived. Always The truth is that it is possible, not not possible, it is probable for you that your heart will tell you that something is right and good and honorable. But in reality, it is wicked and evil. Let me tell you that that's not just sometimes. Most of the time, your heart thinks that bad things are good. Most of the time. Otherwise, why would someone blow up, and this is extreme, but why would someone blow up somebody who doesn't believe in their God? Because their heart is deceit, desper, uh, uh, deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, right? Why would someone think it's okay to cheat on their spouse when they know they can get away with it? Or any other thing, right? Because within them is a heart that is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And why do people think it's right to burn down their neighbor's house in... Uh, in protest against the government, in protest against the police. I'm condemning that. Why do people think it's okay for me to, to burn down a, a business 
and protest against the government because those people have a heart that is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. They think those things are right and they're, they're listening to their deceitful heart and instead of doing what is right, they're loving what is evil. And it's not just them. Everyone succumbs to it. Even you. It's true. Even you. That same heart in them is in you. We need to be careful not to fall into the trap of trusting our own heart for guidance of morality because simply put, we just can't do it very reliably. We might get lucky once or twice and say, murder is wrong. Okay, you got that one right. But yet you go out there thinking it's okay to hate entire groups of people. Right? That's also, you know, wrong, right? <laughs> but we think it's okay. Our hearts are not capable of determining what is right and wrong. We just simply can't do it. In fact, later in this book, we see in Romans chapter 3, we'll see in a couple of weeks, Scripture says that no one is righteous. No one, no, not one. No one does good. No one understands. No one seeks God. Their, their uh, throats are an open grave, right? No one is good. No, not one. Instead, what we need to do if we want to have any hope of wanting to do what's actually objectively right, the only hope that we have is to turn to the one thing that we know can be perfect, and that is the holy, perfect God and his word, right? Roman, uh, uh, sorry, Psalm 19 says this, the law of the Lord is perfect. That's, that's, that's a big statement. It's not just nice or good or good most of the time. It's perfect. Even if my heart says Scripture's not right, my heart's deceitful, but the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul, and the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. More desired are they to be than gold, even much fine gold. And sweeter are they than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Why? For by them your servant is warned. And in keeping them, there is great reward. If we want to make sure that we do not make ourselves an enemy to God, we need to make sure that we don't trust our hearts but instead, we need to make sure that we are just not worthy of choosing for ourselves what is right and what is wrong. Instead, we must turn to his word and trust in him. <sighs> the language of this section here, it's got this whole play of going on of like what is revealed and what is exposed, what is hidden and what is found, right? We have this idea, this poetic language where it focuses on hiding and revealing. Simply put, it shows that God makes it obvious. He revealed everyone plainly his existence and mankind concealed it and hid it away so they could abuse creation for themselves. And therefore, in God's response, he will therefore reveal his wrath and he will reveal it so widely that no one can, can hide that wrath from their sight. That's the picture of what's happening here. But you know, for those who trust in him, there is hope. There is hope. Because even though mankind is sinful and is an enemy to God, it's not God's wish that any should perish. Instead, he incarnated himself into flesh in the form of Jesus Christ, died on the cross for punishment for your sins that you committed, and did so so that anyone who would repent and say, I no longer want to be bound to sin, that he would forgive. Anyone who says, I know that you exist and you define what is right, becomes a friend to God, and God cleanses them of the guilt of their sin and saves them to be in eternity with him. And when we do that, God says that his wrath that he has for us, he spends it on Jesus instead. Jesus didn't do anything wrong. Why did he get it? Because in spending it on Jesus, he did so willingly. Uh, scripture says that it pleases God to crush him. Why? Because when he turns to you, there's no anger left. He accepted the anger upon himself so that when he can look to you, there's no guilt, there's no wrath, there's only perfect love and peace because you are a friend of him. And furthermore, that those who do so spend eternity in heaven with him. And all it takes is belief and confession of sins. So how do we know ourselves and how do we know that we are not an enemy to God? Well, according to Paul, it takes two things. Do not say that you cannot know God, because you can. You do. 
And do not so say that you are worthy of defining what's right and wrong, because you're not. Only God is. And if you do those things, you will find you are God's friend, and you will not be put to shame. Let's pray. Dear Father, thank you for your grace and your love for our service today. And I just pray that you can help us to understand and unpack that. Father, I know there's a lot of people here, and Lord, I'm just really compelled to pray to you the prayer of confession. And if there's anyone here that wants to, to pray this prayer along that you, you guys have heard, I, I want to, I know, and I want to be saved. I, I don't want to be an enemy to God. Pray with me. Pray this prayer with me in your hearts. Dear Father, I am a sinner. I know. I have chosen my path, and it, it is wrong. My heart just loves sin too much. I cannot be worthy in front of you. I have decided that because I don't want to know you, I will do the things that satisfy myself, but I know that that's wrong. Help me, please, to, re- to, to give up my love for sin. And Father, give me your son and his sacrifice so that my sins will be forgiven. Father, I confess my sins to you. Forgive me of my sins and save me from your wrath. Father, thank you for Jesus. And we all pray these things in Jesus' name. And if you prayed that prayer with me today, if you prayed it sincerely, that means that, guess what? You are newly saved Your name is written in the book of life, God says. You have just given all of your sins to Jesus, and all of your sins have just been paid for. And that means that you are no longer an enemy to God. And if that's you, go ahead and contact me and let me know. I really, really want to get in touch with you. We'll have some contact information at the end of today's service. Um, But anyway, let us pursue no longer being an enemy to God. Let us instead pursue I can be his friend because I know him and I know he is good. I know he is right. Anyway, we've talked long enough. Let's go ahead. I think it's appropriate to stand up in in response of singing praise. So let's uh, respond today with a, a song of praise and worship.
Well, praise God. Uh, let's go ahead and, and go to our announcements before we finish today. Now, the first announcement is, uh, you know, if, if you've been watching our services online, uh, but you're not actually part of our youth program or part of our church, drop us a line. I'd really love to get in contact with you. I'm going to put the description uh, in the link, the, sorry, a link in the description to our contact form. But if you have your phone, um, go ahead and hit pause, and you can scan that with your phone, the QR code. And that'll just take you a little form. It tells, you a little bit, tells us a little bit about who you are. And uh, let us know, especially if you prayed that prayer of, of salvation with us today. Um, I'd love to hear it. We'll get in contact with you. We'll make sure you get a Bible, and um, we'll make sure that we uh, just find out where you are and see how it is that we can continue your discipleship and taking care of you. Um, so don't let this opportunity go to waste. Get in touch with us, okay? Uh, next announcement is that is for parents. I have a, a seminar that I'm doing on the 7th. Uh, it's two weeks. Um, and it's going to be on the topic of dealing with children who doubt. So if there are parents in the room watching this, uh, just know that, hey, uh, this is totally open for everybody. Um, it's put on for the members of our church, the parents of our church. But if you've been watching and you just kind of want to check it out, um, information is there, uh, the Zoom meeting. Um, and uh, it's at 3 p.m. on the 7th, so uh, join us. Uh, next is a little information. It's a combined service, not only next week, actually for the next two weeks, uh, but next week is a combined service. That means church starts at 9.15 a.m. next week, and Sunday school is at 11 a.m. next week. And the reason for that is because, let's get the picture on me, yours truly <laughs> is doing a combined service on the topic of missions. I'm preaching on missions next week through the book of Jonah. And so I encourage all of you guys, if you want to check out um, the importance of missions and the heart that it takes for missions to go and preach the uh, message of repentance to those who need it, then join us um, next week at 9.15 a.m. So if you show up at 11, you'll be late. Uh, next announcement is uh, we have, uh, oh, it's our prayer request. So we just want to continue to pray for uh, members of our church. We want to pray for Roger's mother, uh, for her, her chemotherapy that she's receiving. We want to um, they're still evaluating whether or not they can continue with the chemotherapy, if it's something that will be uh, long-term for uh, his family. Um, so I want to pray for her, for her chemotherapy, and that'll go well, and that it becomes a viable treatment for cancer. Next, I want to pray for Jay. Uh, that's Joy's father, and he's still recovering from heart surgery. Uh, so keep them in prayer. It's, it's so He's not able to do much, and it's really hard when a whole member of the family is out of commission and um, just pray for his health and pray for his safety. Uh, we do not want him to have to go back to the hospital, especially now with COVID. So I uh, also want to pray for, speaking of COVID, want to pray for the safety of our community and especially for the vaccine that uh, apparently the distribution of it hasn't been going so hot. But uh, I, I have some friends who have gotten it and uh, nobody's gotten sick as far as I know. So it's good so far. We just want to continue to pray that um, the, the COVID recovery is going well. And finally, I want to pray that you guys are seeking opportunities to reach out and pursue and seek each other because, man, what a quick way to get cut off from church by not talking to one another. So seek each other out uh, and pray for that. Pray for opportunities. Well, let's go ahead now and finish our service. Let's stand up with our doxology, and then we'll finish with our closing prayer. Praise God from whom all blessings flow, praise Him all creatures here below, praise Him above the heavenly host, praise Father, Son, and Holy Let's pray. Dear Father, thank you for your son where you have decided, you saw man in his, his situation where you saw that man was in sin and yet you proved your love for us and that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. You proved your love and that while we were enemies of God, we might become heirs through your son. And that, that shows that this salvation is initiated by you, not by us. It means that we did not, we wanted to be saved, but we didn't want to be saved that way. We didn't want to be saved to have to go back to you. We wanted to be saved to go back to gods of our own invention. But you said that you could work with faith. 
And so you give us your, your son. You incarnated yourself, that means, and you, you came down and dwelled in flesh, obedient to your own law, and died on the cross for our sins so that we may be sons and children of God. Father, thank you for this, and we praise you for it in Jesus' name. And now the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Well, the service is over today, and until we see you next week at 9.15, remember, God and his peace be with you.